This lecture, we're going to use Abacus uh, to solve a heat transfer problem. And we're going to learn just some of the very basics with heat transfer. We're not going to touch on convection at all, um, but just a simple conduction case. Uh, so just as a reminder, so for solving the heat equation, this is the form of the heat equation. Uh, in the transient sense, so function of spatial coordinates as well as time coordinates. Um, and then the steady state of the heat equation, you can assume that uh, the temperature doesn't change with time. And so then you've got a much simpler um, system of equations to solve. Um, and so we're going to solve both transient and steady state problems in this um, uh, module. Also, um, we're going to use, we're going to select a case from the exact uh, project out of the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, and they've got so, some solutions for various different sorts of, of uh, conduction problems. Everything from 1D on, on infinite bodies to 1D spheres to lumped bodies, wave equation, uh, coupled uh, diffusion, and three-dimensional heat equation. Uh, in this section, we're going to look at uh, a specific problem, um, benchmark X11B10T0. It's a... Uh, one-dimensional slab that has uh, an instantaneous jump in temperature at one boundary while retaining a zero temperature at the other boundary. Um, and so, you know, while we say it's some temperature is instantaneous and then some temperature is zero, um, really all we just need to have is have some difference in temperature on either side of the, of the problem. So this is the... Uh, PDF uh, detailing this problem. We're just going to use this as, as inspiration, um, but we do ask some questions on the um, in the provided uh, assignment to compare the results of the analytic solution here with the finite element solution that you'll be computing. Um, so we're going to go ahead and open up Abacus. Okay, and now that we've opened up, opened up Abacus, we're going to go ahead and create a new model database with standard explicit. We're going to just fix our uh, my toolbar here. All right, so the first, we're going to do several models. We're going to name this first model um, to kind of have the name of what we're going to be doing. So heat transfer, steady state, and one step. Uh, we're going to go ahead and create a part, and as we saw in the problem definition, this is while we're looking at one dimension, we're going to model this as a two-dimensional body just so that we actually can see some some finite elements in two dimensions. So we're going to go ahead and we call this the slab, uh, and it's going to be a 2D planar simulation. The base feature will be a shell, and we'll. Uh, leave this 200. Actually, since we're gonna we're gonna try to model things on about the unit scale, let's turn this down to about 10. Again, I'm gonna create a point at zero zero, and I'm going to fix that point in that location. I'm gonna then create a um, my two construction lines for uh, x and y. Uh, dimensions. We're going to go ahead and create our slab. I'm going to use uh, the equal distance uh, constraint to make these two vertices equal distance from the vertex that we um, fixed. We'll go ahead and make this length of 1 
and then we'll create this we'll make a maybe an aspect ratio of 10 so we'll make this a very thin or kind of a thin bar um, so I know that it looks a little bit different than the model we we'd seen here where this model looks kind of tall and thin our model here looks very uh, short and wide um, but we'll see that won't matter that um, with these being insulated here it's effectively the same uh, same problem okay so everything's turned green meaning that we have constrained our sketch so we'll complete our sketch and here's our geometry so now that we've completed our part we're gonna go ahead and create a property and we're gonna go ahead before we get started um, there is some supplemental material on the learning suite on consistent units I just want to point out again just some of the common issues that show up so you might use MATWEB a lot for getting your material property data and if you look at just the kind of breakdowns in in physical properties we'll see metric is in grams per cubic centimeter so if you were working in a CGS unit system or a consistent unit system you'd already have your uh, density values correct however the English system is not uh, normalized to like an inch pound squared uh, so this value is actually uh, considerably higher than what it actually needs to be um, by about a factor of 386 uh, furthermore if we go down to thermal conductivity we have thermal conductivity in units watts per meter Kelvin and so this would be in a the standard SI unit system which is not the CGS unit system that was defined previously at top and even if we look at if we were doing stuff like uh, fusion and vaporization we're in joules per gram we can see that our uh, CTE micrometers per meter if we look at our English systems we have every, all of our thermal units are in BTUs or British thermal units uh, inches and hours and uh, square feet and so there's actually a considerable amount of conversion you'll need to do to get the English system into a consistent unit system so this is just um, a warning that again most professional CAE applications are agnostic to your unit system and they re require the analyst to uh, uh, select and maintain a consistent unit system but for this problem we just want this to be simple so we're just going to create a a very simple uh, thermal so we'll call this uh, alpha 1 and so what I want to do is I'm just going to specify a density with a mass density of 1 a uh, thermal conductivity of one and a uh, specific heat of one and I've chosen alpha one solely from the definition of our heat equation where we have an alpha term that precedes our, our uh, spatial derivatives um, and so just for the sake of getting a simulation in and being able to see some results I'm just going to essentially specify this alpha to be 1. Um, alpha is just a ratio between those uh, uh, thermal properties that we've specified here and the density. Uh, so now we've created our material. We'll create a section. So let's call this uh, alpha 1 section. Uh, and we're using a solid formulation here. So we'll go ahead and use it homogeneous, and we'll call this maybe homogeneous. And then we'll specify um, this region. We'll call the, the set to be the whole part. And select our section. We can see now it's turned green, letting us know that we've assigned a section to the entire domain. And we'll go ahead and make an instance of that slab. And we can see that 
um, we've now applied our global coordinate system. Next, we're going to create a step. And so whereas in our intro to Abacus, we use a static general, we're actually going to do a heat transfer. And so the default is for transient, but we're going to go ahead and set this to be steady state. And just note that this is an important point, but the load variation with time has been changed to ramp linearly over the step. And we'll talk about what that means when we get to the load conditions later. So we're going to solve this in a single step. So we're going to solve to a time period of 1. Again, it says time period, but in steady state, this is really like a pseudo time. Um, and it's an important point to remember when we do a transient simulation. And we'll take the defaults everywhere else. Okay, now, now a few things is we'd like to, for the sake of being able to compare uh, our results here to the results from uh, the exact problem set where they select points at various locations along the width or the along the length. So they pick every at every quarter, so 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1 over the uh, the length they've got then uh, essentially uh, temperature uh, profiles or histories for those points. And so we want to pick out points on our geometry at those exact same locations, kind of probe locations. But you can see we don't really have probe locations here. One thing you could do is you could, could create a mesh and then try to pick out nodes that lie close to those points. But maybe what we want to do is we want to actually have very fine control over where our probes are going to be. And the way to do that is to create geometry and create sets of those geometries and then request output on those sets. So the first thing I'm going to do is maybe I want to have some line running straight down the middle of X. And so we'll go ahead and we'll choose to partition a line between two points. Whoops, sorry, we need to be in our part module to do this. So a straight line between two points. So we'll pick the mid locate or the the midpoint of this curve and the midpoint of this curve, and create this partition. And one thing we'll notice is if we go back to property, Abacus is smart enough to recall or to recognize that um, the new geometries we've made are really part of that original set that we've defined. Okay. Now the next thing we need to do is select points along this at those intervals. So we already have points at intervals x is 0 and x is 1. But we need points at 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. So I'm going to choose to partition an edge by a parameter. So I'm going to choose this edge. And then the normalized parameter along its length, essentially, so about 50% or exactly 50% along this curve, and the direction being from right to left here create this partition and we can see we've created a vertex. We'll see that show up also in our model tree under features, our face partition and our edge partition. We're going to do another uh, partitioning now of each of these two edges that we've created and again halfway along those and so those would be globally 0.25 and 0.75. We can see we've created those uh, points in the geometry there. So again, we've now got three internal points. And these points, uh, with Abacus's meshing algorithm, it'll require a node to fall on these points. And so it's kind of defining our mesh, and so we'll have a nodal value at exactly those points that we can query. And so uh, maybe now what we want to do is we also perhaps want to get a um, uh, let's go ahead and get our get our history output. So if we create a new history output, let's we call this x zero. And we'll see that we haven't quite done everything we need to do yet. But we'll say continue, and it asks us where would you like your history to be on. And what we're going to choose we want a set. But you can see we don't have a set defined for our locations. 
So we're going to open up Tools, Set, Manager, and we're going to create our sets. So we're going to choose, we're going to create one that's called X0, and we're going to pick the geometry associated, which is a vertex associated with X equals zero. Actually, maybe we'll rename this. See if we can put an equal sign in there. We'll create another one called x equals zero, and I'm going to use p for point, as Abacus won't allow me to put a decimal point in there. So 0 0.25. We'll select this point. We'll choose another point, x equals zero, p five zero. We'll pick this middle point. Create a another set x equals 0 0.75 select this point here and lastly x equals 1 and we'll choose this final point over there and so now what we can see is we can select those individual points if we choose so we'll go ahead and we'll create one history output for x equals 0 and the question we have is what do we want for output? Well, let's go ahead and get out nodal temperature. And while we know that x equals 0, it might be nice to actually explicitly print out the coordinates in the x dimension in our global coordinate system. So we're actually going to have it save out x, uh, the x value, which we know to be 0, but this will be useful for post-processing. Also note that uh, uh, we chose the output frequency to be every one uh, solution increment or solver increment. We'll rename this history output to be consistent x equals 0. We'll create another one x equals 0 0.25. And again, choose our set to be x equals 0 0.25 nodal temperature and output coordinate 1. Also, so there was a lot of clicking I did there. I could have easily chosen to copy. And I could just simply copy, rename, and then edit. And so now it's kept the outputs I've requested. And I can just change the set of which I'm outputting from. And it saves me a few clicks, especially when you kind of batch these up. 0 0.75, copy again, x equals 1, and modify them here. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and we've finished specifying our step and specifying the outputs that we want. Uh, we don't have any, any interactions. Again, I've mentioned previously that you could create a film condition which would allow you to specify uh, a uh, convection uh, coefficient if you uh, so desired. Um, but again, yeah, so a surface film condition, you could choose your surface and you could apply a convection coefficient over that. And so here's where you would put those, enter those values in. Um, but again, we're not going to do that. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is we need to modify one thing in our model. So if we double click on our model, we need to specify an absolute zero temperature. And so one of the things that, we'll, that you'll notice is that if we were to specify this to be temperature of zero, and then if we were to use the actual values that we're going to change the boundaries to, to be 1 and 0, uh, just due to numerical accuracy issues, uh, Abacus can accidentally find negative absolute temperatures and will crash Abacus. And so if we were to choose this to be, say, 0 Kelvin, it would be important for us to choose values that are where none of them are actually 0 Kelvin or 0 absolute. So maybe we would choose 2 and 1, or 274.15 and 273.15. Uh, 
Instead, I'm going to go ahead and choose to say that we're maybe in the Celsius is kind of what we're is kind of our base. And so negative 273.15 Kelvin, or z excuse me, Celsius is equal to absolute zero. Um, okay, so now we're again we're in load. One of the things that we need to do is is uh, define our boundary conditions. So again, as we specified, we're going to have a um, uh, jump temperature. We're going to specify this jump temperature to occur on x equals zero uh, surface. So we're going to create a set out of this. Choose these two edges. And again, we're going to say that that temperature is just one. Note that our amplitude here is ramp. Uh, we chose to do this in steady state, and there is, um, we could force a an immediate um, jump if we had done a tabular. We could choose at time zero, the amplitude is one. However, then at the end of our simulation, which is pseudo time of one, our amplitude would still be one, and this would be this absolute jump, and there would be no variation then, then essentially in our load case from zero to one. And so our initial solve would be the same. So we're going to go ahead and leave this as ramp. On the other side, we're going to go ahead and call this our, our uh, uh, zero temp. And we're going to call this x equals 1 surface. And again, select these two edges here for that surface. And the temperature here is zero Celsius. The last thing we need to do is that we haven't defined what the initial temperature is. We could have an initial temperature that's some arbitrary function. We assign a zoidal. We could have uh, the initial temperature on the interior could be zero Kelvin. The initial temperature could be a could be a hundred degrees Celsius. What we're going to actually do here is that again it's a jump temperature, so it's discontinuous here on this line, everything else starts off at time zero. So let's go ahead, or at time zero is zero. Um, so we're going to choose in the initial step to specify a temperature um, predefined field. And again we have, we'll define the um, Let's see if we can unselect. I'm not sure that we'll be able to because it's the whole field. Um, so we should actually just be able to choose our set, which is the whole part. And then we're going to directly specify as being constant through region as a value of zero. We could provide uh, results from, say, a previous simulation result if we chosen. Okay, uh, now we've defined our loads, it's time to define our mesh. And so what we want to do, again, we need to be in the modeling, optimizing on the, or uh, modifying the part. We could choose to mesh this geometry with triangles. And actually one of the questions that we ask in the assignment is to evaluate um, and compare a triangle mesh to a quadrilateral mesh. And so this is where you would you could choose uh, those settings. You could even choose um, to have one region be triangles in this case and the other region be quads. But for this demo we're just going to choose the entire geometry to be a structured quad mesh. And we want to specify maybe to have our um, our uh, 
we want to have like a minimal amount of elements in the Y direction. So we're going to choose to select edges. We're going to choose these two edges. Now I know in the assembly level we selected those as sets, um, but that's at the assembly level. The parts don't have those saved as sets. We're going to select those, and we're going to say we just want a single element on each of those edges. And then maybe we want to have excuse me, on the length, we want to have a hundred elements. And so this is our mesh. So now that we've specified our mesh sizing as well as the mesh the element or the element shape, we now need to specify the element type. So we select again our part. And we need to make sure that the default here is plain stress. We want them to be heat transfer elements. So you can notice that now that we have a DC2, D4, a four node linear heat transfer quad element. We want to make sure that we have less than a thousand nodes. So we'll do a query on our mesh, display the entire part. And we see we only have 303 nodes. So we'll be able to run this in our um, student edition of Abacus. So now we specified our mesh. It's time to now specify a job. So we'll go ahead and create a job. We'll give it the exact same name that we've given our model, heat transfer, steady state, one step. Again, we don't really have any options here that we can change, although we could choose to have a higher nodal output precision, but single is fine for this case. Now that we've created our job, we'll go ahead, we'll run a data check, check the monitor, and see if we have any errors or warnings that need addressing. As you can see, we have none. And so we can go ahead and now just continue our simulation from the data check. And our simulation has completed. We can go ahead and plot. We need to make sure, so right now the plotted parameter variable is uh, grad t. And we again want nodal temperatures. We know that the values are going to change from 0 to 1, uh, the maximum uh, value principle from the heat equation. So I really don't care to look at what these values are. Right now they're just kind of annoying. So I'm going to turn off uh, or uh, the legend. So underneath viewport, viewport annotation options, we can choose to turn off the legend. Okay. So now uh, we want to say get out the actual values um, along that bar. So we can choose to create XY data, use as a source the history output. And then we can select uh, pretty much all the variables that we'd ask for in our history output. Maybe we just want to go ahead and, and save all of those as is to our session. So we'll say as is. If we look at our XY data manager, we can see those have shown up here. And we can uh, plot, say, nodal temperature at a given at a given point. Um, so if we go ahead and say I want to know the temperature at at x equals 0 0.50 we can plot that. And so we've got this line, it looks like a solid line but that's actually not what we've plotted again. We can modify this to show the symbols. And let's go ahead and make these large. We can see that we really only have this single result up here in the top right. So for instance we could turn off the line and we just have a single point time one. So again all this has told us is exactly what the steady state condition is at pseudo time of one. And again the pseudo time is really as we saw 
it scales the load that we've applied. And so we'll see what that means in our very next simulation. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and we'll, for now, we'll just go ahead and delete all of these results. We'll come back to our plot. We're gonna go ahead and save our Abacus session. Let's call this maybe thermal study. And we're going to go back to our part module. So in the intro to Abacus, I mentioned that we can copy models. So let's go ahead and right click on our model and choose to copy. And let's maybe call this same thing but 100 step now. Now all we want to do here is change in our step. We're still going to, still going to go to time 1. We're still going to be steady state. We're going to choose to increment with an increment size of 0 0.01. So we will take a in a hundred uh, increments. So 100 increments of 0 0.01 will give us up to our max time period of one. And we'll go ahead and create a job for this one now. Heat transfer steady state 100 step. We'll run our data check. And again, no errors, no warnings. We will continue our simulation. And what we'll notice now is we can see that we've taken 100 increments and our step time has increased at 0 0.01 at each stage along the way all the way up to our max time. Let's go ahead and plot these results. And again, we'll choose nodal temperature. Maybe we'll turn back on our um, legend here, just to make a point. If we go to the first time, everything is uniform of zero. And now we see that our max nodal temperature is 0 0.01. And so this is maybe a question that I thought we'd specified a, a jump temperature of 1 degree. Well, again, what's happened is we've specified a load, but that load is going to ramp over our time. So it's going to use the current value of the time in the step to scale the load factor, or the load by. So a load of 1 gets scaled by our current time step time, which is 0 0.01, which gives us that load on that edge of 0 0.01. And as we step through, we can see that that clearly is what's going on here. So I'm going to turn back off the legend. We could plot a time history. And so this is, can be very deceiving that this looks like an evolving state. But the question that I, I pose to the viewer is, is this a transient solve? It looks like there's a time history. It looks like it's transient, but is it? Well, so let's just do one quick thing. Let's go ahead and create some XY data, on again, on our history output. Let's choose at x equals 0 0.5. And let's just go ahead and straight plot that. And we'll choose to again turn off our line but show our symbols. Again we see just a, a bunch of single points that move up in a linear line from 0 all the way up to 1. And we can verify that at x0 where we would specified our load to be at. Again our load is ramping from temperature of 0 up to a temperature of 1 at point 1. If we choose to plot all of these points or lines, we can see again we have several linear lines that advance from the beginning of the simulation to the end of the simulation. So at any given time step, we can then show out what our 
temperature distribution is as a function of x at a given time. Okay, so now let's go ahead and let's evaluate the transient case. So we'll copy this model. Sorry, we'll copy. Uh, sure, we'll copy uh, this one-step model, and we'll call this heat transfer TR for transient in one step. We'll switch back to our step module. We'll verify that we're in the heat transfer transient one step case. And now we're going to change our response from steady state to transient. And you'll note now we've gotten a warning or a message that our load variation has been changed to instantaneous. And we'll choose the max number of time steps again is one. And we'll go up to the increment will be a value of one. And so let's just go back and look at our load that we'd specified. If we look at the jump temperature, we'll see that now the amplitude has changed from being ramp to instantaneous. Now we could again ramp it if we chose by again selecting tabular, and we could say choose to ramp from time zero, an amplitude of zero to a time of one to an amplitude of one. And one of the things that's subtle now is now time is actually physical time. I know we chose a dummy material with a dummy alpha, but now time is no longer a pseudo time that scales something, it's, it's a literal time. And so a load like this, this amplitude, would be in real time, at time at zero seconds, there would be zero degrees. At time 0.5, there would be an amplitude of 0.5 degrees on this boundary, and again, the solution is evolving transiently throughout this entire step. We're going to cancel this because we don't want this. We want an instantaneous jump temperature. All right. Let's go back to our job. We'll create a new one for this. Heat transfer transient one step. I encourage you to think about what the solution might look like. We'll run our data check. Again, no errors, no warnings. So we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, our simulation has completed. Let's look at the results. Let's plot by nodal temperature. And let's go ahead and put our legend back on. Okay, so. Here is our solution at time one. And so uh, by choosing our alpha, um, you can see that we've got um, heat has pretty, pretty well propagated throughout this entire part. So what does this temperature profile look like? So again, we, if we come back to our ODB history data, let's go ahead and make sure that we've got our previous temporary data is deleted. We'll create from history output, and we will choose again these points. And we'll go ahead and we will, if we look at these again, we'll notice that we only have a single value for each here on the far right. Again, we took a single step to go from time zero to time one to compute out this final step. Uh, and so we have no information in between for what the actual results are uh, at intermediate times. So let's go. So if we're running a transient, maybe we were running transient because we actually cared about what the evolution of this looked like. So let's go back to part and we'll do another model. We'll copy this transient one step, and now we'll call it transient 100 step. We'll switch back to our step module. We'll edit this, and now let's take 100 increments. 
where each step size is 0 0.01. We'll create a step for this, heat transfer transient 100 step. And we're just going to go straight to, to submitting. And we'll see that again, we've taken 100 increments to solve our problem. And let's look at these results. So now we see nodal temperature distribution that matched our previous simulation. Um, but notably now, we have 100 time increments at which to look at the temperature as it varies. And so this looks, again, very similar to our previous um, steady state solution where we chose 100 steps, where we've got what looks to be some evolving uh, temperature field. Um, but it is slightly different. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this in our plotting. So let's go ahead and create from our XY data. Let's choose at 0 0.50. Let's maybe call this transient temp at x equals 0 0.5. And now this should be clear that now we see we've got a line that we've not yet seen before. If we choose to plot symbols for this to verify the points at which we've extracted data out, we see this is unlike any of the other curves that we've created. And we can compare uh, this in our session to the steady state 100 step by switching over there, creating history output We'll choose that same x equals 0 0.5, and we'll save this as steady state temp at x equals 0 0.5. And if we select both of these and choose to plot both, we'll see now the big key difference in our simulations here. Again, one case was evolving the problem as if it was at steady state, whereas in the other case, we've been evolving it transiently throughout. Now we've run it for a long enough period of time, and so we'll see that the transient case does converge to the steady state case at long time. But again, if we, so one of the other features that's useful with Abacus is we can choose to give ourselves, let's do like a physical comparison. Let's go ahead and let's create a new viewport. And we can choose to then tile these viewports horizontally. And so up at the top here, we're plotting the heat transfer steady state. On the bottom, we select this viewport and we'll choose to select heat transfer transient 100 step. And we can link these viewports together. And we can, as you can see, that they will, you can choose various different things to link, but we can link the frames. So essentially, the frame that's being shown right now is the final frame. And so if we move to time zero, we'll see that they both move. And then this is the real, um, well, let's go ahead and just clean up our annotations real quick. Let's show just the legend. Let's change the legend font size. Let's change it to being fixed with two decimal places, maybe three decimal places. And a font size that's a bit smaller. And let's turn off the bounding box. Let's go ahead and add an annotation for this top. Create an, we'll, we'll try this again. Steady state solver.
That's right, we've turned off our uh, annotation options, I think. Show text and arrows. There we go. We'll create an, an annotation in this one. Text. And this is transient solver. Okay, and now if we choose to animate both of these, it will link in their frame times, and we can just see the evolution of both of these cases. And again, the thing to remember that the steady state solver is essentially solving for the steady state at each load scale factor, is what each frame is. Whereas on the bottom, it's a solution of the transient heat equation at a real time. And so we can go ahead and save an animation from this. Animate, save as, and let's call this compare steady state transient. It's our ABI, Microsoft Video 1, 101. We have 100 frames. Let's make this a four second video, so we'll choose 25 frames per second. Okay. Um, one last thing this, this will help in some of your quantitative analyses that you may find yourselves doing uh, later. Um, so we've created some output. Specifically, we created output for different points in X. Um, and so again, we can see that we've got um, a steady state solution and our transient solution at both points. What can be oftentimes useful to do some quantitative, so we've done some qualitative analysis in here, but maybe we want some quantitative analysis and we want to get this functionality out. Uh, we could use the Python API, um, which we may discuss in a future lecture. We're not going to do that here. We're going to use a built-in plugin from Abacus. So under Plugins, Tools, Excel Utilities. So if you've created XY data, you can choose those to then export to Excel. On the flip side, you could also import from Excel into Abacus. So say you've got, if you had uh, some solution or experimental data and you want to be able to compare your solution, your simulation data to your um, uh, to experimental data, you could do that via here, but we're going to go ahead and hit OK. And an important thing in this is you do need to have Excel installed on your PC for this functionality to work. Uh, Abacus has not come with a built-in Excel uh, capability. So Abacus has exported this now to an Excel, and what it's done is it's um, it hasn't really helped us out here much at all. Um, but if we insert a, a, a row, the we can kind of tell that here what we've got is we've got some sort of time. And so it's it's X and Y and X and Y. So each of your data sets is two columns and then just concatenated along. So now we've got uh, temp temperature. And the other unfortunate thing is we don't no, it's not explicit what those um, or which columns are which. Believe it has to do with the order with which you selected them in Abacus in the export tool. Um, but we can just kind of infer here that this is clearly the um, the steady state solution. Um, so we're going to go ahead 
and we'll say that this is steady state. So this should obviously be, I mean, this should be clear um, to the viewer. And then if we wanted to, we could have maybe an additional column that's variation. Or we call it error. So now the question is, say we'd been using the transient solution, uh, or transient solver, to try to get ourselves to a steady state solution. So the question is, at each point in time, um, what is our error from the transient solution at that point? And we know that our load case is 100. And so we're actually, instead of comparing this value to this value, we need to compare this value to our actual solution of the steady state with that load case, which is 0 0.5. So let's go ahead and say, let's create our equation. So let's do actual minus observed over actual And so what we can see here is that as we evolve in time, we get closer and closer to converging to the actual solution. If we increase our decimal placing out, we can see that we've gotten close to, but not exactly to, our um, exact solution. And so a, a question for the reader is, or for the viewer, how long do you have to run the transient solver to get exactly the steady state solve. Think about that for, for a moment. And we may include this as a uh, thought question on the assignment. All right, that concludes our uh, session here today covering uh, heat transfer in Abacus. Uh, I do recommend that you go ahead now and play around. We've done like this one dimensional case, but create various different uh, cases. You might want to stick in two dimensions as much as possible, but do some uh, unique unique load cases and try see if you can figure out how to apply uh, convection coefficients. You might even uh, come back to the uh, exact tool and there are some there's a multiple different examples here that you could test out as well as there's even uh, a few or similar um, uh, three-dimensional cases that you could try off. So a piecewise internal heating with some convection cooling, or this one's kind of a fun one, uh, insulated boundaries in a piecewise initial condition. So you've got some initial condition in here and then insulated boundaries off here. And go ahead and compare your finite element solution to the analytic solutions and to these uh, into their uh, traces out. So, all right. Well, I hope you found this uh, session to be informative and maybe inspiring.